Uh, so it's a great pleasure to be here, particularly talking about a subject which unfortunately is now even more important given the changing politics of the globe. I'm going to talk about three major aspects. The first, I'm going to talk about climate change, but I'm also going to talk about population and development. Because as I'm going to explain, I don't think you can deal with climate change on its own. Now, this is a radical thought because climate scientists only think about climate. However, I want you to think about all of the aspects. And so therefore, I think there are four major challenges in the world, apart from Trump. OK? Um, <laughs> so I, I, I promised myself I wouldn't. I, I lasted about 32 seconds, OK? <laughs> this is terrible, right? So climate change, of course, passionate about that. But we also have to deal with global poverty. We have to deal with environmental degradation, because not everything is due to climate change. And of course, global security. So why are these important? So let's be serious. Development is essential, because at the moment, 7 million children die needlessly every single year of preventable diseases and starvation. That's the population of Greater London. 700 million people go to bed feeling hungry every night. And 1 billion people, 1 in 7, still do not have access to clean drinking water. Okay? So this is why we have to deal with all of these problems together. So why is this the perfect storm? And I'd love to say, yes, I invented this term. I didn't. It was John Bebbington, the previous uh, chief science advisor to the UK government, because what he noticed was that according to the International Energy Authority, energy demand is going to increase in the next 14 years by about 50%. Food is also going to increase by about 50%. And to feed that, water has to increase by 30% because you need a lot of water to create energy and food. Right in the middle of this, you have climate change, and then you also have two external pressures, which is, of course, rapid development and population growth. So let's start off with climate change. Okay? This is where I do a deep sigh. <sighs> there is nothing complicated about climate change. It is just simple physics. So I can do the whole Brian Cox thing. It's physics. Okay? So <laughs> now you've got it. The reason being is, all that happens is the sun produces huge amounts of energy through fusion, basically burning hydrogen to make helium, releases lots of energy, and that energy hits, well, sometimes the sunlight and sometimes it's this murky grey stuff we get in London, but we get most of the energy as sunlight, okay, in the visible spectrum. Now, about one third of that bounces straight off into space or because of white clouds and because of ice. Because of the albedo, it reflects it. You all know that because I'm hopefully Google sent you all skiing to bond and to actually make yourself feel better about yourself so you can program better. Yes? Please tell me that it's true. No. <laughs> okay? You all have to wear sunglasses because of the reflection of the sunlight of the ice. Okay? So, the albedo of the Earth means lots of sunlight is reflected. Now, the interesting thing is a little bit is absorbed by the atmosphere, luckily by ozone. So ozone captures a little bit of the ultraviolet radiation and stops you getting skin cancer and has allowed evolution to occur without too much DNA damage. But the rest of it passes through the atmosphere as if it's not there. Now, if you imagine being on that tropical island, OK, and you're lying out there, and that sunlight is hitting you. The visible light hits you and makes you feel hot. Because as it hits you, it converts to heat. And the same happens to the Earth. Earth warms up and radiates that heat out. Now, we know the Earth radiates the heat out because it's in balance. Otherwise, the Earth would just continually, continually heat up and heat up and then burn up. So it's in balance. However, what we have here are the greenhouse gases which absorb a little bit of that heat and just keep it warm. 
So, jokingly earlier on about sort of doing some uh, uh, sort of communications, I did a uh, communications with 13-year-olds uh, in a Villiers High School, a comprehensive school in West London. And one of the kids, after I was doing this lecture, went, it's like a duvet. I went, I'm getting somewhere. What do you mean it's like a duvet? Well, the greenhouse gases, they're keeping me warm. I went, yes, I'm getting somewhere. Uh, and I said, so what's climate change? Well, it's like your mother. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure we're going here. This could be problematic. And I went, okay, what do you mean? Oh, well, in winter, she comes in and puts a blank, extra blanket on you. I went, oh, thank you. I said, what does that do? Oh, yeah, well, it makes me sweat. Perfect analogy to what we're doing. So the greenhouse gases, we're all obsessed by CO2, but the major greenhouse gas in the atmosphere is water vapor, okay? followed by carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxides, and CFCs. This is the Mauna Loa Observatory that shows CO2 rise every single year since 1958, when Keeling started to measure it. And we have now passed, in um, 2016, the 400 parts per million by volume. Now, you're going to say, really? Uh, what does that mean? So let's have a look at the past. So this is ice cores. This is 800,000 years ago, so nearly a million years ago. And as you can see, this is methane. This is CO2. These are the ice ages. These are the warm periods. And this is a poor person that works at minus five. Aren't you glad you work at Google? Uh, but this, uh, this is why it's so exciting. You get this beautiful slice of ice from the ice cores from Antarctica and Greenland that actually have bubbles. These are ancient air trapped. So as long as you can extract the air, you have real air to say that's what it was like 200,000 years ago. And as you can see, it goes up and down from 200 parts per million to about 280 parts per million. And yeah, that's what we've done in the last 100 years. Oops, so we've uh, increased CO2 by 40% and doubled methane. Okay? We're really trying hard here. Okay? So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is mandated by the UN to every five to six years, summarize the science. And so I have all the chapters summarizing the science. Most interesting thing for you is that there is a summary for policymakers. That is a political document because all 192 countries in the UN have agreed to the wording. Okay? Lots of uh, politics, lots of movement, etc. So the interesting thing is all the countries have signed up to the actual summary for policy. So what does this report say? It basically says there's a huge weight of evidence for climate change. This is the temperature curve for the whole planet measured for that last 150 years. Now, if anybody shows you one curve, disbelieve them because, of course, it's about weight of evidence. So this is all these groups, which is the Met Office, it's NOAA, it's NASA, have put all these together in different ways. And as you can see, strong warming of about one degree over the last 150 years. Okay? 2016, I had to change this slide because it was 2015 was the warmest year in record. Now it's 2016. There is a pattern occurring over the last 10 years of my slides. Um, it's always last year which was the warmest. This is the summary geographically of that. As you can see, intense warming over the Amazonia, uh, North Africa, and in the high Arctic of more than two degrees. But that's just temperature. Are there any other things that are going to tell us that this is really happening? Well, you know I mentioned skiing, and you obviously all like skiing. Yeah, OK, so <clears throat> northern hemisphere snow cover since 1980 has been dropping markedly. Oops. Uh, sea ice, uh, which of course the BBC love because uh, Richard uh, Haverburn loves to go up there and go, look, it's melting. It's like, yes, it's summer. Um, <laughs> there you are, okay? Any excuse to get up to the Arctic. Um, this is the most worrying one. This is the heat content of the ocean. Unlike the atmosphere that warms up and cools down very rapidly, the ocean has a huge heat inertia. And that's literally just going up. And sea level rise, as you can see, steadily increasing. Now, the only good thing about sea level rise is that it is on the order of three to four millimeters per year. So it's not suddenly going to catch us out. But we do need to plan 
if it starts to accelerate, it might go up to 9 millimeters per year. That may not sound a lot, but over a decade, that makes a big difference to flood defenses and things like that. So that's great. So the past seems to say we're having climate change, and we know from lab experiments and atmospheric experiments that greenhouse gases do absorb heat. So how do we predict the future? I mean, this is the ridiculous stage we've got to whereby we expect scientists, such as myself, to be able to go, hmm, in the future, I see. So these are the models. These are the models that basically gridded system, has air atmosphere, has the ocean, has land, and they all interact with thermodynamics. Okay? We know all the equations of uh, movement and motion. We can do it quite well. And the reason why you're here at Google is because of this huge increase in computer power. So this is the first assessment report, which was back in 1990. And yes, Britain really was part of Europe. Okay, <laughs> physically, okay? Second one, 95, got a better improvement. We then got to sort of uh, the third one and the fourth one. And as you can see now, we're down to the fifth one. We're about 100 kilometers square for the resolution of these models. That's because of the huge increase in computer power that we can now access. The really scary thing, though, is actually, um, yeah, the results haven't changed. We've, been, we've put more things in. We've added more subsections of the climate system. And it still tells us the same thing. Right, so what does that tell us? So the problem is, to predict the future, you have to predict you lot. By you lot, not just you. I mean the whole world. Okay? So just people in general, which is not that easy. So what scientists do is they get together a group of the great and the good economists, because they know what happens in the future, and social scientists, and then say, right, tell us stories, or sorry, technically scenarios for what the future would look like. So this one here, this is the business as usual. Okay? Uh, I used to call that the George Bush model. I'm now <laughs> going to have to call it the Trump model, okay? um, which is we keep burning fossil fuels at the same rate as we're doing now and we get to about four to six degrees by the end of the century. Now, this one is the most interesting one, this blue one. So this blue one is political. So the complete failure of the negotiations in Copenhagen in 2009, the politicians went away with one thing, which was at least we agreed a two degree target. It's like, yeah, why not 2.1? Why not 1.9? Uh, yeah, because it sounded nice around and there was some sort of science underneath it. Okay? Yeah, not much. Okay? Particularly if you happen to be a low-lying island state, two degrees means your country will be flooded. Okay? But they agreed two degrees. So they said to the scientists, right, okay, guys, we need you to have a two-degree uh, scenario. Show us what we need to do to make the world better. OK, so this is this blue one. And guess what? The models, if fed the right uh, scenario, guess what? We keep it to two degrees. Now I'm going to reveal to you what that means. So the wonderful quote is, limiting carbon emissions will require sustained and substantial effort. The 2015 Paris Agreement shows you have to do this. So that's your business as usual. This is the emissions if we're going to actually keep it. Now, there are two major problems with that. The first one is, by 2020, which I believe is only in three years' time, we have to start to cut global emissions by 3% per year, which is more than we've been growing it. Okay? So we have to completely reverse the oil tanker. Good analogy. And by 2070, and this is something that scientists don't tell you, yeah, by 2070, we uh, have to have negative emissions. OK, so let, let's, let's perceive that. So that means the whole world does not emit any carbon. Or if it does, it sneakily sucks it back in to their country somehow. And then on top of that, to make sure we hit the two degree target, we have to suck out even more. OK, hmm. So, so that's the Paris Agreement. That is what all countries have signed up for. Okay, and I'll show you a bit later why even Obama didn't know how to actually do this for the US. Okay? Right. So why is climate change so insidious and problematic? 
Because again, let's, let's think about it. If it gets about two degrees warmer on average in London, are we really going to complain? If it gets about three or four degrees warmer on the south coast of England, wouldn't well, that be quite good, you know? We could have the English Riviera actually being like from southern France. We could grow beautiful wine, etc. Well, the problem is that if you have climate change, and by the way, you have to squint a bit, okay, or have lots of caffeine like I've had, um, there is climate change in there. So I put the average up. And so this could be, this could be rainfall, this could be heat, doesn't matter. Whichever one you want, you can pick. Now, the interesting thing is that every society has a coping range. Okay? I'll give you an example of London. London's temperature coping range is zero degrees. Okay? Below zero, it starts to fail. And if there's that sort of, oh, I can't remember what it's called, it's white and fluffy. <laughs> oh, yeah, snow. Uh, if you have snow, the tube trains refuse to come out. They say, oh, we're not coming out. There's white stuff out there, okay? <laughs> Compare that with Toronto, where, yeah, two meters. Yeah, now we're having it a bit tough, okay? And that's just in autumn, okay? So, again, different coping range. And the upper range, people start dying of heat related illnesses in London at 26 and a half degrees. That's a cold sauna, okay? 26 and a half. Now in Athens, it's 28 and a half degrees. Okay, so there are these built in things. So if you don't change that, this is what happens. So again, occasionally you have a flood or a heat wave that goes beyond your coping range. Okay, that will happen. But if you don't move the coping range or the infrastructure, you get more of these events. So just because I thought. I'll stick with your hometown. So there you are. Uh, you're the big yellow dot. Okay, that's Google. Um, I couldn't make it any smaller. You wouldn't see it. Okay, so there you are. Google has taken over most of Candom. Um, <laughs> so this is the picture of the temperature nominally at night in the heat wave in 2003. Okay, uh, this is why all the rich people live in Richmond or Palm Thames. Okay, including my CEO. Right. So. If we have a look, the temperatures peaked both in July and then in early August. We had the first recorded 100 degree Fahrenheit temperature in England. <gasps> yes, yeah, so my Texan friends said, ah, oh, spring. My African friends went, most of the year. And why? <laughs> so why is this special? But if you look at the blue, this blue dotted line is the death rate. This is the increase in death rate. The estimation is that through northern Europe, 35 to 70,000 people died of heat related complications due to the his heat wave. Okay? Now, and I love the medics because it's not you lot, and it's not children, it's not young people that are most vulnerable, it's old people. And not during the day. It's when they go to sleep, they can't aerate themselves, they can't hydrate themselves, and that's when the complications kick in. So what do the medics call this? Harvesting. Because these poor people were going to die sometime near the future, you know, maybe 5, 10, 15 years, so they've just been taken a bit early due to the heat. Now, why doesn't this happen in, well, let's say, uh, Texas every single summer? Well, because they all have air conditioning. Now, we don't have air conditioning in most uh, old people's homes, and we certainly don't have it in people, old people's homes. Okay, so again, it's an adaptation. And just to really uh, make you pleased that you're in a nice air-conditioned office here, and you might want to have a look at your home. Um, so this is the anomaly for 2003. These are the modelled temperatures for uh, northern Europe. And so by 2040, that summer will be the average temperature for London. So we better adapt. And of course, you still have extreme events of up to four degrees above that baseline. Okay? Just because you've moved the baseline doesn't mean you don't get extreme events. So we need to move our infrastructure on. So, ooh, sorry, I had to do that. Right, um, so what are the main effects of climate change? Because I'm then going to go on to a bit of population. 
and a bit of development. So the first thing is more extreme floods, droughts, and heat waves and storms. Also, in places that they haven't previously been. Because when you heat up the planet, you're actually expanding the climate zones, so therefore you're moving climate zones into new areas that haven't previously got these events. May lead to food and water insecurity. One of the things about the Lancet report that we found was when we sat down over two years with the great and the good at UCL, we realized that it wasn't doctors, it wasn't hospitals. Actually, the greatest threat to human health in the future is just access to water and food. Okay? Once you've got that, you can then build everything else onto it. And the last one, which everybody talks about, may lead to migration and conflict. I will flag up here that people do not like to move. Okay? People do not move unless they have to. And with conflict, the UN did a review of all the water dispute, international water disputes in uh, the world, and they found that nearly 85% of those ended with a negotiated treaty and were peaceful. Only 15% of those ended up in some sort of conflict. And the UN's uh, summary of this is that climate change doesn't cause conflict, but if you want a really good excuse to having a conflict, then water resources and things like that are a very good excuse. Okay? So, is this all because we've just got too many people on the planet? Please do not take this advice. And as I always point out, um, please, let's, let's not go back to the fashion, okay? Okay? So, is it just because we've got too many people? I mean, I read the Daily Mail. It tells me that there are loads of poor people out in the rest of the world are just making it worse for us, okay? So, how does population work? So, we have what's called the demographic transition. So, we start off with... Um, traditional uh, uh, societies where you have high mortality rates, so a large number of babies and mothers uh, die, um, and therefore you have high fertility to match that out. Okay? So you may have eight babies per mother, and two of them make it to adulthood. Okay? Now, interestingly, you need 2.2 in a society to have replacement. Okay? to make sure that you keep the population stable. So you have very low population growth. In the 50s, due to the huge acceleration of society and uh, capitalism, we then had huge changes in medicine. Most of the major diseases were vaccinated against or preventable. Okay? Amazing. So what happened is mortality rate crashed. Okay? So therefore, low mortality, but society still had high fertility, huge population. You then have women's education and empowerment. Forget anybody that tells you it's about uh, contraception. We, in this country and Northern Europe, went through the demographic transition during the Victorian period with no pill. And trust me, you really wouldn't want the condoms of those days because they're only for the rich and they're made out of, I believe, it was sheep's bladder. Okay? Ooh. Right. So. We can do this, and what the key is, women's education up to secondary school level. Okay? Now, I, when I teach this to my students, I have to look at the guys and apologize to them because they all think they're in control. Okay? <laughs> they think they're, in, think they're in control of lots of things, of their fertility, how many children they're going to get. Yeah, no, you're not. I hate to tell you this, it is women who are in control once they understand their fertility. Okay? So, all of this went horribly wrong in the 1960s, and we had 2% growth in population during that period of time. We're now below 1%, and we're going to drop by the end of the century to a negative. We're going to have some shrinkage. So the world population is expected to hit about 9 and a bit billion by the middle of the century. Okay? We're at 7.4 now. Okay? So that is still an extra 2 billion people that we have to figure into our society and how to actually feed them. Now, big problem here is that up to very recently, family planning was not on the international agenda. Then Obama came in, and the first thing he did was remove the gag law 
from all US funding so that UN funding could be for family planning. Trump, I think it was day two, okay? I think he was mucking up the CIA on the day one, but day two, first thing he did was put the gag law back, and now it's even tougher, which is any agency in the UN who even mentions family planning, because family planning in their eyes means abortion, um, unfortunately won't get any US funding, okay? So we're now back, but the key thing is family planning is not about abortion, sterilization, or contraception. It is mainly about women's empowerment and women's education. So now I've cheered you up. <sighs> Sorry. Um, so, OK, so we're going to have 10 billion people by the middle of the century. Uh, we've got rapid development, and we could have temperature changes of over 4 degrees. But still haven't answered the question, is it because we all have those poor people, you know, those countries that aren't developed? Uh, it's because they're all those people causing all this pollution. <sighs> No. It is because of consumption. Okay, so this is the total uh, per capita emissions for different countries. So we see here US, if we happen to be in Google in California, yeah, we will be, yeah, each of us 19 tons of carbon per person per year. Okay, uh, just by moving to London, actually, you only uh, pollute by eight tons of carbon per person per year. Okay, and of course, these are the projections for 2030, so America is coming down, Europe with all the strict regulation is coming down, but of course the UK may be leaving, so that will go up again. Uh, China, Brazil and India. You know that two degree target I showed you and that wonderful <laughs> curve? To do that fairly, all countries have to be on the red line, which is two tons of carbon per person per year. Now, just imagine you are Obama with 19 tons per person per year, and you're looking at climate change as one of these serious things. You now know how difficult it is to actually deal with climate change in a political sense. OK, so let's get political. Perhaps it's just lack of money, OK? You know, perhaps we're just too poor to deal with this, OK? Yeah, guess what? Yeah, that's GDP growth uh, for the world. Um, admittedly, I did start it in the 16th and 17th century, but, you know, it just literally is a straight-up line. And as you're here, I thought I'd tell you. So U UK D uh, GDP growth was $2.9 trillion last year. That's how much money we made last year as a country. So why do we have poor people? Okay. So... I'm a geographer, so therefore, I'm sorry, you could have a map. So this is, uh, this is where the people are. This is the money. This is the people. Money. Pe Not a really, even I can't get a correlation between those two, and I fudged a lot of things in my time, okay? Right. So this is, I love this. This is from Oxfam. So the first thing is, uh, academic research has shown that the richest 1% of adults in 2014 owned 48% of the world resources. By 2015, it was 50%. Bottom half owns less than 1%. And in 2010, that was the same as 388 billionaires. So 380 billionaires owned the same as the bottom 3.5 billion people. It drops, it drops, and drops. And in 2015, shockingly, it was 62 billionaires. You had to get into a room about this size. Actually, yeah, there's about, yeah, about that, about, about this size. Those people owned the same amount of wealth as 3.5 billion people. So they redid the calculation this year, and it now it's down to eight people. Okay? Eight people owned the wealth of the bottom half. And you wonder why we have problems dealing with issues. Right, so not to leave you depressed and miserable going back to your work going, oh, why do we bother? OK, because <laughs> I feel that would be really mean. Okay, um, I have to deal with students, undergraduates. They're very sensitive people. So <laughs> solutions. All the solutions exist. Okay, This is the ridiculous thing about climate change. It is just pollution. 
Okay? All the solutions exist, we can deal with it. So, 50% of all the energy requirements for the world have yet to be built. Okay? Huge opportunity. And therefore, yeah, wind, wave, solar, yeah, fusion. Hmm, well, if we actually invested in it properly, it might work. But there are a couple of things stopping us. So renewables are competitive against fossil fuels. Okay? Don't allow any economist to tell you they're not. The reason they're not is because of the global subsidies. So the International Monetary Fund, you know, that well-known left-wing think tank, um, suggests that the subsidies are about $5.3 trillion. Okay, so that's twice the GDP of the United Kingdom, the fifth largest economy in the world. Still, just. So, why? But people think that fossil fuel companies are in the private sector. Eh, not true. The big 25, so you take the big 25 companies, 19 of them are either part or fully state owned. Okay? And therefore, if you have a company that's producing huge amounts of uh, uh, petrodollars for your country, you're going to go, here, have some tax. Have some tax back. Yeah, of course you can do that. Yeah, I'm not going to charge you anything. Okay? Again, think about it. I love the fact that Norway wants to go carbon neutral in the future. Except, of course, Statoil, which is owned by the Norwegian government, means that they have the largest sovereign wealth fund of any country in the world, which is now about $250 billion. Okay? They have no idea how to spend that on the 7 million people in their country. Okay? So, however, one of the big problems in developing, uh, developed countries, I apologise, is not for fossil fuels, it is transport. So in the UK, building, um, sort of uh, energy, all of those are coming down, slowly ratcheting down. And I have to say, look, really? Really, do you, do I really gonna buy that car? I'm sorry, you know? So I'm, I'm here to say you have to push the whole global cool, okay? Because look, these are two supercars, okay? So that, that's the, for the petrol heads, that's the uh, Porsche and that's the McLarens. Uh, they both suggest uh, they can do 0 to 60 in 2.6 seconds, then the McLaren is 2.7 seconds. But we won't say that, okay? Won't German technology, we won't say anything about it. But how do they do that? With an electric engine. So these are hybrids. So they have an electric engine that basically generates a huge amount of torque, takes them up to about 60 or 70 miles an hour, and then after that they go, petrol, which then takes you up to 200 plus, okay? So, Tesla, so again, the future is electric, okay? Because you can then generate all the electricity through green means and then feed. So hopefully, in the next 20 years, every single car you'll see outside here will have to be electric, okay? By the way, if you don't believe me, Look at the warfare that goes on for parking spaces outside Harvey Nicks, okay? You have expensive Teslas and smart cars fighting for parking spaces because electric cars get free parking spaces, okay? It's all about manipulating little rules and society. So I want to give you... No! Oh, that's okay. There is a, there is a map here. But it's gone. Never mind. Um, you didn't need to see that. So... <laughs> The classic thing is that America is where we will win and lose the whole climate change agenda. Okay? The reason being is because it produces second most amount of CO2 in the world and where America goes, everybody else follows. So this is about high speed trains. So at the moment, China is building 11,000 miles of high speed trains. Germany already has over 1,000 miles and the US has 456. So this is a beautiful study by America 2050 because you can get rid of almost all flights in the US okay, overnight if you built high-speed railways. And the thing is people assume that all the flights are from east to west and west to east. Absolute rubbish. Most flights are within these small corridors up and down the coast to Chicago or up and down bits of California or the northwest. Okay small hop flights that you don't need. So again, 
you can build railways 360 miles per hour and you could quite happily remove 90% of all flights in the US. Okay? Brilliant solution. Hey, and guess what? It will produce jobs. You would have to actually get the steel, uh, American steel companies up and running to produce all the railway lines, etc. It so beautifully ticks all the buttons, except for coal, because they're not steam powered trains. Okay? Right. So, there are also market solutions. You don't have to just hope this happens. So again, market solutions have been tried and tested. So for CO2, there are a number of ways you can do it. The first one is that you uh, tax the actual polluter, or you give out permits. <coughs> so in Europe, what's interesting is there is the emissions trading scheme whereby companies have to trade permits. And this trading scheme was incredibly successful in the US when they were trying to get rid of sulfur dioxide from power stations. And it was uh, the Clean Air Act. There were huge cries that this was going to cost $8 billion to enact by trading, and meaning that the people that could clean up quickest and fastest and most efficiently did first, only cost them a billion dollars to clean up all of their power stations and stop acid rain. You can embed the cost in the actual item. So if you have a high carbon uh, item, then it has an extra whack of dosh in there. And what you should do is then you pull all of that money back into the treasury and you give it back out to schemes that reduce CO2. Simple economics. Okay? It means that you punish the people and the items that you don't want. You drive innovation because people suddenly find out a way to do it. Oh, by the way, if you want to make your fortune, not just here at Google, okay? If you want to make your fortune, um, if you can invent an additive for concrete, okay? So at the moment, concrete, you take all the bits and pieces and you put it into gas burners and you have to heat it up to 1,400 degrees Celsius, okay? Which then makes an aggregate, which makes concrete, which builds almost every single building in the world. If you can get it down to heating it up only to 900 degrees with a magic ingredient, guess what? We can then use electricity. We can use heaters. And therefore, you wouldn't need all those gas burners. So, Because uh, concrete is one of the biggest uh, CO2 emitters, both by production and by uh, uh, movement around the country. Okay? So if you have a great plan and you can sprinkle some magic dust in there. That's, so those are the sort of innovations we need to really drop the actual system down. Now, so how do you embed this in? So of course, there's this whole move now to progressive inclusive capitalism. Well, there was last year. Uh, I'm not sure about this year. So they're, they're, they're the idea you have the triple bottom line. So you have the economics. So you have to actually have companies which are uh, healthy, innovative, that grow, employ more people. But at the same time, you, you and governments have to understand that you have to deal with the social to make sure that there are uh, supports for everybody. And you then have to deal with the environment and make sure you actually can put all those together. Now, the ridiculous thing is that if you look at post-Second World War, it was realized by governments that markets don't work because of the failure between the wars. So all governments interfered with the economics and international economics to help set exchange rates until the 80s, where then that was removed through neoliberalism. And the interesting thing is they call it progressive inclusive capitalism. Bizarrely enough, as far as I can tell, it's just social democracy. Okay, but you know, name, A name for a new century. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of thoughts. So climate change is one of the major four issues of this century. But you cannot deal with climate change without dealing with the other four, uh, the other three. Okay? You need to be able to have win-win solutions for all of it. Okay? Also, this is a wonderful cartoon by Joe Pett that came out in US Today in 2009 because this was just the great Copenhagen sort of uh, uh, conference. We're all going to love each other. It was all going to be so much better. And actually, interestingly, Obama mucked it up. 
And the reason why he mucked it up was because the NSA was listening in and actually accessing everybody Dropbox. So don't use Dropbox, because um, the NSA is listening. And they basically took everybody's negotiation notes, and the US knew exactly what everybody else was doing at Copenhagen. Okay? Colleagues of mine spend our time with developing countries telling them not to use Dropbox and certain other things and how to actually encrypt and make sure that they keep their negotiation stance a little bit more secret than Copenhagen. But that's by the by. Uh, so just think, we could, if we deal with climate change, have energy independence. Why should we be beholden on Russian gas? Preserve the rainforest, sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, renewables, clean water, air, healthy children, etc. And as somebody says, what if it's a big hoax and we've created a better world for nothing? Thank you. Thank you very much. We do have time for questions. Uh, please wait for the microphone. Yep. Um, by the way, feel free to ask any questions about climate change. There are no stupid questions in climate change. Yeah, so I read a very interesting book. It's, it's called Without Hot Air. Probably you know it by David Mackay. Mm -hmm. And it basically makes some calculations about what we actually need to do to, say, make Britain 100% renewables. Yep. And the short answer is very hard. And, you know, so I wonder, w one thing you didn't mention is uh, nuclear energy. So what's your position on that? Okay, so um, two questions in there. Is it really hard to turn the whole of the UK into renewables? Yes, it is, because you need 20% baseline that you can rely on, okay? So you can have 80%, which is wind or solar, which comes and goes, etc. Hence why people are interested in tidal. Tidal's research is about 20 years behind wind, okay? So the problem is that it's not very uh, well developed. You need that 20% because uh, when you lot are watching, and the one that I have to say, um, uh, Jan will like this one. So I always, for the uh, students, I always say, just think, it's the World Cup final, England are playing Germany. It's a fantasy, but we're playing, okay? Uh, England are 1-0 down at half time, and what do you do? Everybody goes and switches the kettle on. So the national grid literally watches TV and has the radio times in front of them for when they have to switch on that base load to be able to uh, cope with your huge demand when you need your beer, cup of tea, etc. at half time, okay? Or interestingly enough, as soon as Strictly finishes, <laughs> okay? Th there are some major peaks in there. Uh, so that's how they do it. So yes, it is difficult, but at the moment, we have a mixture, which means that from anything from about 15 up to 25% every day is already renewables, okay? So we're starting to do that. The nuclear question. The nuclear question is problematic. So I always take a nice sidestep and say, if you live in a democracy, then your democracy has to decide whether the risks are worth taking. Okay? There are two things to remember about nuclear. It is relatively carbon free when it's producing. But remember, it is one of the largest balls of concrete ever constructed. You also have to ship the uranium, unless you have a fast breeder, and then you're even more worried, um, from other countries. And also, we have no idea what the carbon footprint of storing the material for the next 10,000 years. Okay? So you can play with your carbon footprint of nuclear however you like to make it nice or not nice. But my answer is usually it's democracies that decide. So in Germany, they have decided that that is not the route they want to go down, whereas in France, they went, yay! <laughs> and basically, they have a major problem, which is they have to now work out how to afford new nuclear power plants because about 80% of their fuel comes, uh, energy comes from nuclear. That's a wonderful get out. Next question. Yep. Thank you. So I read an article some days ago about CO not being, uh, CO2, sorry, uh, not being the, the real measure of how we impact um, uh, global warming and you said something about it. So is there any other variable that we can somehow measure and see um, that is causing global warming that is not CO2? Right, okay, so 
you will see that there are different measures. So there is how much CO2 is in the atmosphere, which is actually a pretty good measure because it is the major greenhouse gas. Okay? In the models, when you see that there is, let's say there's four degrees warming, the models will all agree that only half of that is direct warming from CO2, methane, and the other pollutant greenhouse gases. The other half is from water vapor. So because there's a positive feedback, about half the warming we get in all the models is because as we heat up the planet, more moisture is in the atmosphere that heats up. So those are the uh, little wonderful uh, models within models that we run. So that's, that's that bit. Second bit is there are other ways of actually putting all the greenhouse gases together but not water vapor called CO2 equivalent. And so what they do is they take methane, CFCs, nitrous oxides, and they work out the warming potential. So every methane is 21 times more powerful than CO2 at holding heat. Luckily, it's only in the billions, whereas CO2 is in the millions. And then you add them all up, and that gives you a total greenhouse loading. That helps. So the problem is then, of course, scientists don't tell that to people. So whether you're talking about CO2 or CO2 equivalents, and the other one that's also naughty is people talk about carbon tonnage, which, of course, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere in tons is different from the amount of CO2 because, of course, you've got two oxygens. Okay, so there are lots of different measures, but you can quite happily move between them. Um, and actually, at the end of the day, it's all going up and it's all going to hell. <laughs> so no, no, it's different. And so I have a question. Um, yep. Sorry. Uh, so there are unfortunately still people who think that climate change is either not influenced by humans at all or uh, a complete fabrication. Uh, do you talk to these people? And some of them are even policymakers. Do you talk to these people? And how do you talk to these? So um, there is a group of skeptics. They're becoming much older and shrinking in number. Um, so the first book that I wrote, so the, the version you have, the red one, is actually uh, edition three. And the weird thing is I've had to rewrite the book because so much changes in climate change. So the first one came out in 2004, and it was written because there were so many questions that normal people had about climate change and things about the history of it, about the politics, so I put that all together. A lot of us engage constantly with the public, the media, and there is a, I would say there is a, a small cabal of about 20 scientists in the UK that regularly engage to try to block or counter uh, ridiculous statements from the skeptics. Um, uh, again, I, perhaps I shouldn't say this on camera, but you know, I'm on Twitter, and occasionally when I'm bored, when my daughter is having a swimming lesson, I will just basically pick a fight with a skeptic. On Twitter, <laughs> I'm bored. Climate change is real. Ha, 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 ha. You know, or something like that. So we all do. We have different approaches. So Richard Betts at the Met Office is incredibly polite and conciliatory and will basically invite them over for dinner and things like that. They still don't change their mind. I'm slightly less friendly. <laughs> so, yeah. But we do. There's a huge amount. It's actually easier here. I, again, I have to utmost respect for my colleagues in the US who deal with it in the US because it is vicious. What would you recommend as a um, call to action for us as individuals who sort of believe in this course? Right. So the individual actions are problematic. The reason being is because, not because I don't think that you should try to be aware of your own carbon footprint and influence the people around you. But the big problem is that if we all went and lived in Wales in a commune in tents with a link to Google, um, the problem then is our carbon footprint would only drop by half. The reason being is half the pollution that we emit every year is done by the government on our behalf hospitals, roads, uh, tr all of that, okay? So the key thing is actually being able to live as good as we can. So again, move towards a more vegetarian diet is usually a very good one for your health. 
and for sort of uh, the environment. Uh, try to cut down on your uh, uh, flights if you can, and try to do that, have a better house. All of that's great, but actually the most important thing you can do is work through the democratic system and make sure you have policymakers in place that are going to make a difference. Now the interesting thing is for a good 15 years when we had Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, they were obsessed with climate change and it went into every single layer of government. And even after two uh, other governments, there's still all that regulation that they're still trying to unpick. So again, actually policy making is where it is. So again, I'd say it's actually being a voter and making sure your local MP knows that you care about this passionately. Yeah, uh, you pretty much answered my question. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, factory farming yep. and how much influence that has in your opinion. Right, so farming is a double-edged sword. Okay, It's a nightmare, so I'll give you as much as I can. Firstly, uh, industrialized farming, like factory farming, um, is highly uh, fossil fuel intensive. Again, heating, lighting, et cetera, et cetera. And also, interestingly, cows under that system produce a lot of methane from both ends. My daughter loves this, that they make, uh, they're more from the front than the back, actually. Um, so huge carbon footprint. But Catch-22 is that we're going to have an extra 2 billion people in the world. And actually, the green revolution that happened in South America and Asia are great. Didn't happen in Africa so much, so we need to actually deal with that. The problem is, if we're going to produce enough food in the future, we need to help them industrialize their farming, which is going to produce more CO2 and more methane. So it's that catch-22. Yes, in this country, we could do farming in a much greener way and produce less CO2. Brilliant. And we'll still produce the same amount of food. But we're also then going to have to try and help other countries industrialize their farming in perhaps the greenest way they can. So does that answer your question? It is a problem. It is a uh, one that we need to actually deal with. But actually, the solution is also complicated by there being a growth in population. Time for one more question. Uh, two more questions. <laughs> Just to follow on from that, but maybe to ask a question that's a little closer to home, how do you view the growth of the IT sector? Is that a problem or is that a solution? So, well, the interesting thing, so I, I am on a corporate social responsibility board for big IT company, uh, Seprosteria in French. Um, but mainly Europe and India. And so, again, the interesting thing is that IT has a really interesting intersection. One, because firstly, you do produce a lot of uh, carbon, basically because you have server farms, et cetera, et cetera. And it's interesting that lots of companies like Amazon are actually making sure that those have as low footprint as possible. Brilliant. Second thing is, what we found, and I have got a, I was telling, um, yeah, and I have a spin out company set out in Harwell because companies want to be green. Okay, that's the first thing. They want to manage their environmental resources, but they are uh, because they know that also it makes uh, financial sense. It saves them money as well as everything else. The problem they have in this day and age is lack of knowledge because there's so much data. So IT companies are absolutely essential. Because again, if you want to measure your CO2 footprint of your company, most companies go, I make widgets. How am I going to do that? And that's when IT comes in and actually be able to automate knowledge and data and how you produce it. So um, interestingly enough, I think IT is right at the heart of this. Because if you have data and you start measuring things, things get better. We found that with the Millennium Development Goals globally. If people start measuring something, people then start focusing on it and go, ooh, now that's bad. Right, OK, we can move it on. So yeah, right at the heart. I know that wasn't because I'm at Google. Dun -dun. Right. Oh, we have server farms, and we try and yeah. keep them green. Um, uh, quick question. Do you think we all managed to stay at a two-degree world? 
<laughs> oh, thank you. So just, just put me on the spot here. Um, honestly, the conversations that scientists have is highly unlikely we're going to stay to a two degree world. The most obvious thing was that four years ago, uh, Oxford organized a conference uh, called Living in a Four Degree World. Okay? And the problem there is that this was admittedly before Paris. So Paris has given us some hope. I mean, Paris even talks about having a one and a half degree target. Okay? I mean, I can barely work out how to get to a two degree target, and that's with me, me being world dictator. Okay? Um, no idea how to get to one and a half. We're unlikely to hit the two degree target. However, my view is how close we can come to that and be as far away from four degrees or six degrees as possible, the better. So as a target, brilliant. If we miss it by a small amount or even half a degree, I'm, I'm, I will be happy, okay? But no, we're not ever going to make the two degree target. Thank you very much, Professor Mark Meslin. <laughs>